Hey folks, Joseph Sabora here. Yeah, I just took my lamp that's in the back and decided to move it to the right corner so that way I can give better lightning here yeah, for this video and for the room. <laughs> yeah, because I did actually have some trouble, you know, trying to get some better lightning in my uh, the Breakfast Club mover review that I did the, this particular week, but I figured, why not? I mean, I had to do some tweaking of some brightness here just to see how better it will look, even though it still look a little dark, but whatever. Nobody's perfect. So. <laughs> but it is a classic uh, John Hughes um, coming-of-age comedy drama that you'll never get tired of. And Yeah, because everything happens, you know, I'd be cracking skulls. <laughs> okay. But I'm excited to review another coming-of-age comedy that's actually set in the 80s, 1988 to be exact, <laughs> called Take Me Home Tonight, which is based on the song by Eddie Money from 1986, which unfortunately was not featured in the movie, despite the fact that it was in the theatrical trailer, some TV spots, and even on the Blu-ray and DVD menu. And yes, I did recently bought the Blu-ray at Dollar Tree that comes with a digital copy. Interestingly enough, I actually bought the DVD as well two years ago, but I haven't even opened it. Yeah, what's wrong with me? <laughs> but don't worry, I've seen the movie um, a few times, and it's great to revisit it after all these years. And I still like this movie. I, I think it's a fun um, 80s nostalgia uh, party comedy that just is totally overlooked. It uh, doesn't get the attention it deserves, and I can see why. Because um, it actually got set on the shelf by Studio Universal Pictures uh, under the label of Rogue, which is part of uh, a joint venture for both Universal and Focus Features. This was going to be a new label for them, or what seems to be, because originally it was uh, a label from Polygram Films and Universal. Yeah, just when Universal bought out Polygram uh, through um, Seagram and Son. Yeah. And it was also the company that gave us films like Shaun of the Dead, Orgasmo, and and several others, even Unleash. Yeah. But Relativity Media had bought out the company and the film actually had sat on shelf for five years until it finally got its release. Mostly due to, you're gonna love this, drug use in this film. Which to me is incredibly absurd and totally deplorable because I think what they don't know was that for a movie that's set in the 80s, drugs was very prominent. You know, the fact that they used cocaine during this particular lifestyle. And I guess, you know, maybe they're just too afraid to actually use this for the film. And I just think it's totally ridiculous because I've seen a lot of films in the 2000s and 2010s where they used drugs. So, what were they thinking? So uh, kudos to producer Ryan Kavanaugh to actually put this out, hoping that this would actually do so well. But sad to say, it couldn't. You know, it had to be released in early March and opened at number 11 at the box office. So it became a flop, failed to recuperate uh, for its $19 million budget. That's what happens. You know, when they could have done a better job releasing it at a better date, or maybe they could have thought of a, a better excuse, but what can we do? <laughs> and it really is a shame, because uh, Topher Grace uh, is a very talented actor, he's very fun, um, sort of like a, I guess you could say, a modern day uh, Michael J. Fox right there. I don't know, I mean, it's kind of a tough comparison here. <laughs> Uh, but, of course, Telford Grace has been best known for playing Eric in the TV show, That 70s Show, 
which interesting enough, uh, we actually got two writers from the same series. Yep, uh, you guessed it. Uh, Jackie and Jeff uh, Fugo. So they joined in and also Grace is um, the executive producer and also wrote the story. So hoping that this would actually do so well here. And so I guess you could say this is like that 70s show that's set in the 80s. I mean I know there was a spin-off called that 80s show but that didn't last long and I guess you know, they, maybe people weren't really interested despite of that. Um, you also got Anna Ferris, you know, from the scary movie films, and, which I know the cover art doesn't look exactly like her, and I'm surprised. She looked quite different. She almost looks a little bit like, sort of like, uh, <laughs> like Emma Stone right there. Um, but that actually was supposed to be her on the cover. Um, there's also uh, Dan Fugler, you know, who was in the movie uh, Balls of Fury and the Fantastic Beast films. Yeah, that's him. And that's supposed to be right there. Um, Teresa Palmer, an Australian actress. Um, has some nice features right here on the back. So you got like uh, deleted scenes, uh, the cast get together, a music boombox. Even a music video, which definitely uh, pays a dedication to um, all the 80s movies. So you have the entire cast dressed up in the style of all these other 80s films, as we all know, like Dirty Dancing, Back to the Future, uh, Predator, Aliens, uh, The Terminator. Uh, you guessed it, a lot of films from that era. So I love that. Um, what's actually the song was called uh, Don't You Rock Me, which is a cover version of um, the song by Human League. Yeah. So, I love this. Um, as you can see. <laughs> uh, sorry. Yeah, you see the digital copy and you can see the, uh, the Blu-ray. Um, just has a limitless uh, advertisement to put in. Okay, so uh, let's get to the review. It stars once again Topher Grace from That '70s Show, Anna Ferris from Scary Movie Films. She has, of course, the TV show uh, Mom with Alice and Jenny. Uh, Dan Fugler, Balls of Fury, and and uh, the Fantastic Beast films. Teresa Palmer, Chris Pratt, yes, Chris Pratt, who had his TV show at the time called Parks and Recreation, and also later went on to do um, Guardians of the Galaxy films, <laughs> and the Jurassic World films, too. Michael Bean, yes, he's in this movie, so it's cool that they got an 80s star to join in, uh, who's always been best known for playing Kyle Reese in The Terminator, and went on to play Hicks in Aliens. Lucy Punch, yes, that's her last name. Michelle Trackenberg, yes, Michelle Trackenberg, yeah, from The Adventures of Pete and Pete and several films that she's been in, as you all know. Even the Harriet the Spy. Dimitri Martin, Michael Ann Black. Jennifer Goodwin, yes, Jennifer Goodwin from Ramona Beasts, uh, the TV show uh, Once Upon a Time, and several films. Bob Oakenkirk, uh, Angie Everhart, yes, Angie Everhart, who's been in films like uh, Bodello of Blood from Tales from the Crib, uh, the movie Jade, uh, and I know she's a model herself. Yeah. She's a total knockout, uh, a very hot redhead. Uh, Edwin Hodge, Candice uh, Kroslak, Natalie Kelly, and Robert Hoffman. It's written once again by Jackie and Jeff Frugo from That 70s Show. And it's directed by Michael Douse, uh, the same director who went on to do films like Goon and um, What If. 
or it, which was originally titled The F Word. Yeah, he's a Canadian director. The movie begins when we meet a young MIT graduate named Matt Franklin, who's played by Topher Grace, who actually works at Suncoast Video in 1988. Yes, as we all know, Suncoast is definitely a movie lover's dream. It's located at the shopping mall, so you go inside and you definitely see tons of VHS tapes, you know, Laserdisc, you know, DVDs, and all this other stuff. All this memorabilia, which has movie posters around. I mean, man, it's like, and going inside is a breath of fresh air, and I really love it. And I really miss that store, too, because I used to go there a lot at uh, my local shopping mall. Two locations I've been to, you know, the Burbank and Glendale Malls. And I always love to shop there just so I could buy some movies and some other stuff. I even had a card, so I was a member for Suncoast. And... <laughs> I even still have all these old uh, Suncoast bags too, which I put all these DVDs in there just to keep it safe with all these uh, old receipts. I know. I I just can't help it. It's 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 total nostalgia right there. It was a very popular store, but nowadays, you know, it's it's all these stores have been closed down, and I hardly ever get a Suncoast in my area unless it's far away from where I am. So it's such a shame. I really love that store. Well, anyway, uh, back to that. Uh, Matt is trying to figure out what he wants to do in life since he has a police officer for a fodder named Bill Franklin, who's played by Michael Bean, who actually had grown impatient with. While, while working at Suncoast during that one particular day, he actually met his high school crush named Tori Frederkine, was played by Teresa Palmer, who walks in the store just so she could buy some some VHS titles that she wanted to choose from. So at that point on, Matt decided to pretend that he doesn't work there because he doesn't want to feel too embarrassed. Um, so he wanted to pretend like he actually works at a uh, law firm called Goldman Sachs, just an effort to impress her a whole lot better. And because of that, Tori suddenly invites uh, Matt to a Labor Day party. Probably going to be the best night ever that he wants to join in. And he's actually hosted by Matt's twin sister, who's actually uh, Wendy's uh, boyfriend, Kyle Matterson, who's played by Chris Pratt. Uh, inside his uh, hillside home. And of course, Wendy is played by uh, Anna Ferris. So. so later that night, uh, Matt, Wendy, and Matt's best friend, Barry Nathan, who's played by Dan Fugler, who actually uh, works at a, at a car dealership who just got fired that particular day. And they're about to head to the party, so Barry decided to steal a brand new Mercedes-Benz convertible, uh, which I know that led to trouble too because the alarm went off. I mean, he actually tries to put in the code so that way you know it doesn't get into trouble, but it was too late. So he actually, so even Matt was trying to go back inside the car, but <laughs> but when he rolls up the window, telling them he's a pussy, so. <sighs> So he, Matt decided to go back to um, to Barry, and Barry just uh, takes the keys from the drawer and just went all the way back to the um, dealership to take the Mercedes Benz, and they were on their way. Um, so at this rate, it was I think it was basically the boss's car or so, because that's when um, he began to find out that that there was cocaine inside the club department. That's when Barry suddenly got hyped up using all that cocaine. Um, yeah, the, um, Matt kind of tried it out a little bit, you know, just to see what it tastes like. And, well, they were on their way, and once they got there, well, they were just doing all these conversations, 
while Barry is just snorting some cocaine, you know, try to meet some ladies around, you know, getting to know them. Uh, Matt actually bumps in a friend who was in a wheelchair, um, but he was just trying to tell him to actually fool him because, of course, his friend does work at Goldman Sachs. So anyway, he was just trying to find a way to actually impress uh, Tori, you know, just try to lie and, and say all this other stuff that what he does and you know, try and do his best to actually fall in love with Tori. And this is exactly what he had to do. Uh, Wendy's uh, boyfriend suddenly proposed to her, you know, during, right in front of everyone at the party. And, you know, because we begin to find out that Wendy was attending a graduate school at University of Cambridge that's in England. So she's trying the, her best to actually wait until she finally got in, but, well, that was uh, another story here. Um, so, yes, there was a dance-off that was going around, you know, there... <laughs> Yeah, between Barry and and that dancer, which <laughs> already is snorting with cocaine, he just actually kicks him in the nuts. So th this was like a, a very <laughs> huge one. So now both uh, Matt and Tori decided to, along with Barry, to actually drive off to another party that's being hosted by the boss in Beverly Hills. Matt took Tori there in the Mercedes while Barry rides with two of her friends in another car. Uh, also, I began to notice that Barry did met uh, another girl uh, named Ashley, who's a golf, a golf type. Yeah, played by Michelle Treckenberg. So this is, <laughs> there was actually a love scene between them. But you get the idea. Anyway, Barry said, so, but suddenly, even with the cocaine that, um, that Barry has, he suddenly had a wild sexual encounter with a cougar. And, yes, an older woman who, named uh, Trisha Anderson, who's played by Angie Everhart. A guy named Francis, I think that was her lover, started to watch him, you know, having sex in the bathroom, which that was pretty uh, awkward, but pretty sexy too. <laughs> okay, but, and then Matt and Tori suddenly continues, um, you know, to mingle with each other. They, they wind up uh, going, you know, Matt suddenly successfully puts down Tori's boss. You know, they actually even played the, a game called you know, penis, you know, the penis game, where they had to, to yell penis in front of everyone. Yeah, I know, it's disgusting, but whatever. Um, hey, if you saw uh, 500 Days of Summer, I guess you get the idea. <laughs> uh, so they left the party, they went inside uh, a neighbor's backyard where they jump on a trampoline, they play truth or dare, and they wound up having sex. <sighs> Until... This particular cliche pops up with the unbelievable truth. Um, but when he suddenly shares an unopened omission letter from Cambridge to Cal just to see if she got in, but it was been revealed that she didn't got accepted, so that sucks. But he figured that you know maybe when he should actually be with Cal for now on, and things will will probably get even better, you know, once they get married, but even that wasn't working out, too. So, I guess at this point on, you know, they just had the best time of their lives, you know, having the best party of their lives, you know, if even if they're going through a lot of um, difficult situations. So. But either way, um, I enjoy the film. It's definitely worth watching, I mean, mostly for 80s nostalgia, and also dealing with all these um, funny situations here and there. I mean, the whole film is basically about relationships and, 
and trying to get to know somebody and hoping that things will turn out for the better for this one particular night. So it's a party movie, but it's worth it. But it almost looked like this movie was shot in the 80s, considering that it was shot in 2007. So they must have used some 35mm film elements to join in with some grainy shots here and there. So it doesn't look too digital. Um, and yes, it does have a lot of technology and all the style. They did put um, a mix of 80 songs, all of which are from the early to mid 80s. You know, songs like uh, a Video Kill the Radio Star, which is by The Buggles. Yes, yeah, the song that had the first music video being played when MTV first launched. And by the way, um, the score was actually done by the founder of the band, and I believe lead singer, Trevor Horn. So that's really cool that they brought in to, to compose uh, the film. And also, besides that song, they also had some other random 80s songs, like Straight Outta Compton song. So I guess you could say it, it definitely feels like 1988 in that sort of way. Um, I know uh, I know Matt does look almost a little slightly like Michael J. Fox there, I mean with that style, even for 1988, I, but this was the same style that he looked uh, in recent years, like in, I mean that's what I expected. Um, but the rest did pretty much look like, you know, they did came directly from the 80s. I mean, yes, uh, Barry does look a little bit like Booger uh, from the movie Revenge of the Nerds. Uh, um, uh, Wendy does look like, yeah, she did came directly from one of those 80s films I've seen. Otherwise, she probably looked quite different. And Tori... <laughs> Yeah, she definitely looks like she came from the 80s or right. I mean, with that particular style. The hairstyle. You know, the use of muse and all of that. Uh, even Chris Pratt almost looked like, <laughs> like he might have came from the 80s and stuff. Um, definitely the most memorable scene in the film was when... Um, and Matt had to take the risk to actually ride inside... A ball, yes, a ball, which was um, underneath the the trunk of the the truck, because you know they, uh, Kyle was actually planning on uh, actually having everyone to ride onto that ball, you know, <laughs> but they couldn't because you know they were afraid. But Matt, who's usually afraid anyway, because he's very shy, decided to take the risk, and he actually was riding inside and it just rolls all the way down into the hill it actually cr um, crashes all these other uh, cars uh, that's parked on the side of the hills and and winds up crashing all the way down into the neighbor's backyard that has a swimming pool and he went inside and yeah he even threw up too you know because of how fast the ride was going and yes he actually got a cut on his temple and so he was bleeding uh... Barry just came by and saved his life you know inside the swimming pool <laughs> just when he got out of there so he survived that and it was probably the only scene you'll probably you'll probably never forget but sadly if you haven't seen the movie then I think you're really missing out but. Um, yes, there are cliches in the film, you know, the unbelievable truth, again, I'm tired of that cliche, why can't they stop it with that shit already, but that's just what the story had to go for, and it is pretty funny, I mean, to be fair, it's, it's not as bad as you may think, I mean, yes, you know, people scream out loud, you know, all, all these uh, penis jokes join in, or any other sex related jokes and drugs and stuff so it doesn't hurt the film I mean that's just the whole point <laughs> um, and um, 
I thought this really, I thought this film had a heart to it, actually, if you ask me. I mean, it's not perfect, but it definitely has uh, the heart in, in the right place, so I, I enjoy that. And I love the cast. Um, love the cinematography, because it has the 80s style to it. There's also another memorable note here, too, with all the 80s clothes that they had. Uh, there was actually uh, one guy who does smoke, and he wears a beanie. Uh, he actually was wearing, you're going to love this, uh, a t-shirt of K-Rock 106.7. Yeah, it's an alternative rock radio station in Los Angeles, in Pasadena. And yes, he even says Rock of the 80s. I mean, this is something I never thought I would see in a movie like this. Because it makes more sense that this was set in the valley, even though the film was shot in Phoenix, Arizona in 2007. <laughs> so at times like this it does look a little bit more valley-ish even though it's all set in Phoenix. So I'm trying to give it that style. But it was not, it was a good nod to see that because that, that would have been an awesome t-shirt to wear. And I do listen to K-Rock too, you know, because they play a lot of um, alternative songs. They play a lot of alternative rock songs and everything. And whenever it's 80s, 90s, or today, they, they play those. Um, I mean, looking back at uh, Suncoast video, I mean, it's always fun to look at all these movie posters of all these random universal titles that they put in. I mean, you can pretty much tell because those films did came out. I mean, Harry and the Hendersons was on home video by that time, and so they were new releases back then and all of that. I mean, considering the fact this, that this film was originally going to be released by Universal. Um, and yes, also another thing too was that um, this was also produced by uh, Imagine Entertainment. Yeah, Brian Grazer and Ron Howard's production company. Which actually shows the 1988 logo, or 89, uh, which is the same logo that they use in in the late 80s, uh, early 90s films, such as The Burbs and uh, Parenthood, uh, among others. Yeah, so it's great to see that logo at the beginning. Um, it's sad that the film got uh, mixed reviews from critics. I mean, granted, there are a few critics who recommended the movie, including Richard Roper. Uh, I don't usually agree with Roper, but at least he got this one right. Um, so he uh, so he gave it a positive review, and so was uh, Peter Travers uh, for the Rolling Stone. But people say that this movie was unfunny, and so it only got like a 27% on Rotten Tomatoes. I'm sorry, but. I mean, these are the same critics who recommend some other shitty movies that I don't even give a flying fuck about. So they just never get this film a chance. And so I, I, I just don't get it. And that's why the film is uh, totally overlooked. Underrated, too. It's worth checking out. I mean, especially if you love uh, 80s nostalgia. And you love um, Topher Grace from That 70s Show, uh, as well as Anna Faris, uh, Dan Fugler, and and even Teresa Palmer. Because I always thought uh, both uh, Grace and Palmer had terrific chemistry together. And it's, it's great to see all these other actors joining in. And it was cool to see Chris Pratt in the film. He was very funny as Kyle Madison, who was supposed to be uh, Winnie's uh, boyfriend. And I know they were going to get married and stuff. But nevertheless, uh, he's cool. I mean, it's great to see Michael Bean in this film. Because he's very good as uh, as his father and as a police officer. There's even a scene in the movie where... Uh, <laughs> which I know they, they were going to do this too. Uh, when, when both Matt and Barry were driving off... Because yeah, after what just happened, um, they're, they're about to snort, snort some cocaine and then suddenly they went out of control. They forgot to hit the brakes and they just, they try to stop and the car just swoops around. 
till they wound up um, stopping right between the, the branches until they've been pulled over you know by the cops and yes that includes uh, his father uh, Bill and you know they you know they're about to pull them inside the the police car but they just gave him a warning <laughs> so they're just like fooling them around yeah remember that next time so that that was a pretty funny moment uh, but anyway uh, um, good movie not perfect but just just a cool uh, just a good coming of age comedy with a heart set in the 80's so, so there you go so that's uh, Take Me Home Tonight and I give the movie three and a half stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora and I'll see you later. Bye.